More now from the conference with Congressional Budget Office Director Douglas Elmendorf. He discussed the most recent budget and economic outlook. This is 35 Minutes. Well, good morning again. It's fe it feels like you're drinking out of a fire hose uh, after that talk, for sure, and actually after the last couple of talks. So we're pleased that um, we've been having such, ex such excitement this morning. Um, Doug Ellendorf became the eighth director of the Congressional Budget Office on January 22, 2009. He brings to us today an impressive background to his assignment. Uh, his undergraduate degree is from Princeton, Phi Beta Kappa, received his master's and doctorate from Harvard. Uh, one of his dissertation committee members spoke to us this morning, Larry Summers. He also had Marty Feldstein and Greg Mankiw. Um, our speaker was previously an assistant professor at Harvard, served on the staff of Council of Economic Advisors, the Federal Reserve Board. He also served as deputy assistant secretary for economic policy at the Treasury. Before he became CBO, Doug was a senior fellow in the Economic Studies program at the Brookings Institute. That kind of ends my biographical background. Many people know uh, Doug and his work. Um, uh, from an administrative standpoint, we will try to get some questions in. Uh, I know we've been a little uh, uh, ta uh, taxed for time, so at this time, I'd like to invite Doug to his presentation, and we'll take some Q&A, hopefully, right after he presents. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's great to be back at NABE. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm going to mostly stand here while I talk. Uh, um, rather than uh, just focusing on the budget this morning, I thought it would be useful to spend most of my time talking about CBO's perspective on the U.S. economic outlook. And then I will uh, wrap up uh, by talking about uh, the budget. I know your next session will go into budget issues in greater detail. I want to try to address uh, five questions. First. Um, most importantly, how will the labor market evolve? Uh, together with our budget and economic outlook released a few weeks ago, we released a separate report on the slow recovery of the labor market. So I will start with that. Then I'll talk briefly about how rapidly we think potential output will grow, how rapidly we think actual output will grow, uh, what the paths will be for inflation, interest rates, and the labor share of income. And then I will wrap up by talking about the resulting uh, projections for the budget. About the labor market, in our view, the slow recovery of the labor market largely reflects slow growth in the demand for goods and services, with a smaller role for structural factors. We think there is considerable slack remaining in the labor market, and specifically, we think the economy is about six million jobs short of where it would be if the unemployment rate was back down to its pre-recession level and the labor force participation rate was back up to where it would be without the current cyclical weakness. So here's the unemployment rate um, graphed through uh, late last year. Obviously, it went up very sharply and has reversed a little more than half of its uh, increase since before the recession. The net increase in the unemployment rate from the end of 2007 to the end of last year was about two percentage points. And we think that of that roughly two percentage point net increase, about one percentage point can be attributed to cyclical uh, weakness in the demand for goods and services and thus in businesses demand for workers. Uh, we think the other percentage point roughly can be attributed to structural factors of which about half we attribute to uh, stigma and erosion of skills uh, arising from long-term unemployment and the other half to a decrease in the efficiency of matching workers and jobs at least partly uh, from a mismatch uh, in skills and locations. These are of course estimates um, and rely heavily on our judgment and on the empirical work we've been able to draw. Uh, but we try to quantify uh, these concepts, and I'll give you another several sets of quantifications as I go along, uh, to be concrete about what we think is happening. So with, that, uh, with those structural factors, we think that the natural rate of unemployment, uh, the rate that would arise apart from the weakness in demand for goods and services, has gone up from about 5% before the recession to about 6% uh, now. And as we look ahead, we see that natural rate declining uh, to about five and a quarter percent by the end of the coming decade, which is our normal horizon for budget and economic projections. And we expect the natural rate to decline as those structural factors wane. We think the actual rate of unemployment will fall back down close to, but not quite to, the natural rate of unemployment. 
and I will explain that gap in just a moment. Uh, so by 2024, we think the unemployment rate will be 5.5%, and that difference of half a percentage point relative to what was the case before the recession uh, comes in two pieces in our analysis. The first piece is about a quarter point remaining extra unemployment, remaining at higher natural rate of unemployment because of the stigma and erosion of skills from long-term unemployment. So we think the natural rate will be about five and a quarter percent rather than the five percent it was before the recession. And this shows, I think, the very long shadow of having so many people out of work for such a long period of time. We also think there'll be about a quarter percentage point gap between the natural rate of unemployment and the actual rate of unemployment. And that reflects what we expect to be a shortfall of output relative to its potential. Let me explain that. That's a difference in our projection uh, this year from our projections in past years. If you look back at the gap between actual and potential GDP that we estimate uh, over the last uh, several decades, you can see that there is a lot more of that mass below the waterline than above it. In other words, the shortfalls of output relative to its potential have been more frequent and larger than the excesses of output over its potential during economic booms. Uh, and that picture is even more striking if one adds, of course, the last set of years uh, of this uh, very long and uh, sustained uh, weakness in the economy. Our projection going forward is that the output gap will narrow, but will not entirely dissipate. And we are simply taking our cue from the historical average. Uh, on average, over the past several decades, and indeed overall since the Second World War, actual output has been a little below our estimate of potential output on balance. So we're not predicting any particular cyclical events in the second half of, uh, of our coming uh, projection, but we're trying to allow for this average gap. Okay, the other um, crucial uh, and, at least to us, surprising uh, feature of the uh, aspect of the labor market over the past uh, few years has been the participation rate in the labor force, uh, which, as you know, has fallen uh, quite distinctly uh, and fallen more rapidly since the recession started than the years before that. Uh, of the, there's now been about a three percentage point decline in the unemployment rate from before the recession to the end of last year. And of that roughly three percentage point net decline, uh, we attribute about half or one and a half percentage points to long-term trends, uh, primarily the aging of the population and the move into baby boomers into retirement. Another percentage point we attribute to the cyclical weakness in the demand for goods and services and people's choosing to stay out of the labor force or to leave the labor force uh, because they can't find jobs, because the job prospects uh, are so poor. And we attribute about half a percentage point to discouraged workers who have dropped out of the labor force permanently. Some of these folks have gone into Social Security's disability insurance program, for which the number of people going in has moved up very noticeably in the last few years. Others have simply uh, left the labor force to do other things with their time. Um, but we think that um, about half a percentage point on the participation rate of its decline can be explained by, by those folks who we think will not come back into the labor force. In contrast, the people who are out because of the cyclical weakness are people we expect will come back uh, as job prospects improve. So our uh, forecast for the labor force participation rate shows that just a gradual downward trend over the next several years. That's the net result of two factors, the cyclical recovery that we expect in the demand for goods and services and thus the demand for workers will pull people back into the labor force, tend to pull up the participation rate. But the demographic factors uh, will continue to pull down the participation rate. So over the next four years, we think demographic factors will uh, win that battle slightly and the participation rate will come down a little bit. Beyond that point, uh, once the cyclical recovery uh, will be complete in our, uh, in our view, then the demographic factors are the crucial factors, uh, and they push down the participation rate a little more sharply. It's another piece uh, of this story, though, that we also talked about in our report, uh, which is the effects of federal fiscal policy. I'll come to that in a moment. So between uh, 2007 and 2024, in our projection, the participation rate in the labor force will have fallen by five percentage points. And of that five percentage point decline, we uh, expect about three and a half percentage points to owe to the demographic factors, and again, primarily the aging of the population and the retirement of baby boomers. This is just the other side of the story I talk a lot about in terms of the pressures on the federal budget, as those people move into ages where federal benefits uh, are, are much more generous. Uh, we think about uh, half, a little under half a percentage point 
of that total five percentage point decline in the participation rate uh, comes from discouraged workers who have left the labor force uh, permanently. Uh, and the last, about a percentage point, uh, we think owes to federal fiscal policy. Uh, uh, the larger share of that stems from the Affordable Care Act and the reduced incentives to work that arise when people with lower income receive a benefit, which is then withdrawn uh, as their income rises. Uh, the other part of this is the bracket, real bracket creep in the individual income tax. As you know, that individual income tax brackets are indexed for inflation, uh, but we expect that real income growth will outpace inflation, and those people will move gradually into higher tax brackets and thus face higher effective tax rates on their work. Uh, so if you put together the unemployment rate and the participation rate, we can look at the share of the population that is employed. As you know, uh, this fell very uh, markedly uh, during the recession and has essentially uh, moved sideways uh, since the end of the recession. As we look forward for the next four years, we expect that rate to edge up a little bit. This is, again, the cyclical recovery uh, in the increase in the participation rate and decline in the unemployment rate. We'll tend to pull up the share of the population that's employed. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, the demographic factors are continuing to weigh uh, on, on this share of the population. And after the cyclical recovery is complete, as we project, uh, in about uh, four years, then the demographic factors show through, and we think the employment to population ratio uh, will, will tend to fall gradually. Okay, so that was a quick uh, review of the labor market. Um, let me move on to the other questions that I raised. Uh, one is how rapidly will potential output grow and the main point that I'd like to make here is to compare uh, the history of the last uh, 60 or so years with our projections for the coming decade. Uh, potential GDP uh, grew, we estimate, by about three and a quarter percent over the last 60 years on an annual average basis. We think we'll grow only a little over two percent over the coming decade. And nearly all of that slowdown can be explained directly by slower growth of the potential labor force. Um, in the uh, period of, of the historical average, um, we did not have the retirement of the baby boom generation very much. And moreover, we had a very sharp run-up in women's participation in the labor force uh, from the 50s really into the late 90s. But that has now crested. Uh, and women uh, between the ages of 25 and 54 now have a participation rate that is gradually falling, um, much like what the male participation rate of people that age has, has been doing for a number of decades. So with the waning of that uh, big run-up in the participation rate among women and with the retirement of the baby boom generation, we think the potential labor force uh, will grow much more slowly. That also has consequences for the rate of capital accumulation, uh, in our view, and leads to much slower growth of potential output. Uh, actual output, uh, we think, will catch up almost to potential over the next four years. We think the output gap will be down to uh, just a quarter uh, percent by the end of 2017. Uh, but actual output doesn't catch entirely up to potential in our projections for the reasons I mentioned earlier, which is that over a long historical period, uh, actual output has averaged a little bit below uh, potential output. So we're looking for, um, as I said, the output gap to close from about 4% at the end of last year uh, to about half a percent at the end of 2017 and in subsequent years. Um, real GDP growth averages 2.5% a year over the next decade under our projections, a little above the rate of growth of potential GDP over that decade uh, because of this period of catch-up. Uh, and you can see the catching up here. I uh, should note that this line separating the actual and projected uh, falls after 2012 and before 2013 because this figure was taken from our outlook and we completed our economic projections before the BEA uh, released its estimate for the fourth quarter. So that 2013 is the, is the continuation of that uh, flat segment we look for GDP growth this year, next year, and the year after to be a little above 3% in each of those years. And then after the catch-up period, actual output growth recedes to be in line with the growth of potential GDP. Um, I don't want to skip these other uh, important variables, so let me talk a bit about each of them. Uh, the inflation rate, uh, as you know, this is uh, PCE prices. The PCE inflation rate uh, uh, has fallen uh, since the recession. Uh, to, has remained, the core inflation rate has remained below the Federal Reserve's objective. We think looking ahead, inflation rate will gradually come back up uh, toward that objective and will uh, stay there for the rest of the, rest of the decade. Uh, interest rates, 
Uh, as you know, the 10-year note rate um, has been moving up on average um, since last year. Uh, we think it will continue to rise, and we look for the Federal Reserve uh, to begin raising the funds rate in the second half of uh, next year, second half of 2015. And those rates uh, level out at about 5 percent for the 10-year rate and 3.7 uh, percent uh, for the three-month Treasury bill rate. Uh, labor compensation uh, growth has slowed very distinctly uh, since the beginning of the recession. We think this is confirming evidence that substantial slack remains in the labor market. Um, and uh, as a result of that, the labor share of income uh, has fallen, uh, continuing uh, downward trend that we've seen for a number of decades. As we look ahead, we think as the labor market strengthens, that compensation growth will pick up uh, and the labor share of income will rise. But it will, uh, in this projection, still a decade from now, be a little below its average over the past 30 years. And so we think part of what we've seen in the labor share over the last few years is a cyclical phenomenon that will be reversed. But we think the downward trend over the past several decades uh, is a persistent uh, matter that will not uh, go away um, just be, uh, when this downturn ends. So um, these economic projections, of course, are the base for, on which we build our projections of the budget. Um, this picture shows federal deficits uh, and a few years of surpluses. Uh, the deficit has come down uh, very markedly over the past several years uh, from about $1.4 trillion, or 10, nearly 10 percent of GDP in 2009, to an estimated roughly $500 billion, um, uh, about 3 percent of GDP uh, in 2014 under current law. We think the deficit will fall again a bit next year, uh, but will then rise. You can see, though, that deficits over the next decade uh, stay close to 3 percent of GDP, uh, which is essentially their average uh, share of GDP uh, over the past 40 years. Um, uh, but that similarity to the past um, is worth noting, but also in some ways uh, masks two important aspects of the budget that will be very different than they've been in the past. Uh, so one of those uh, aspects is the composition of federal spending. Um, in this picture, uh, these bars show Social Security spending as a share of GDP uh, 40 years ago, uh, and our estimate for this year under current law, uh, and then our projection for 10 years from now. And you can see growth in Social Security, uh, exceeding growth in the economy, so a rising share of GDP being devoted to Social Security benefits. Uh, and that arises, of course, uh, over the next decade from the aging of the population. We project there will be more than one-third more beneficiaries of old age and survivor's insurance 10 years from now than there are today. The major health care programs uh, are rising even more dramatically. Um, that stems from us three sources. The first is the aging of the population, which will push up costs in Medicare, of course, but also in Medicaid. A uh, second source is rising health care costs per person. Uh, that has been underway for a number of decades. Um, that has slowed recently, and our projections take on board that slowdown. Uh, but nonetheless, we expect health care costs per person in the federal programs and the economy more generally will continue uh, to rise faster than GDP per person. And the third factor here, of course, is the significant expansion of federal subsidies for health insurance under the Affordable Care Act. In sharp contrast with the growth of spending for those programs, uh, spent all other mandatory spending, which basically refers to other benefit programs, uh, we think will be a smaller share of GDP uh, over the next decade uh, than it, has, uh, it is now or has, uh, was 40 years ago. Uh, defense spending uh, is shrinking relative to the size of the economy, given the caps on defense funding that are in current law. Uh, and non-defense discretionary spending, everything else the government does except for making interest payments, is also uh, falling as a share of GDP um, under the caps on funding. If you take the three right sets of bars here, everything the government does, apart from Social Security, the major health care programs, and net interest, uh, that entire set of spending will, a decade from now, be a smaller share of the economy under our projections for current law than it has been at any point since at least 1940. So the growth of government spending, which you can see in this last set of bars I put up, stems not from growth in the size of the government generally, but from growth in a handful of very large programs. Well, the rest of the government's uh, funding 
is actually heading to be a smaller share of the economy than it's been at any point in 70 years. Um, the other way in which the future is very different from the past uh, is the level of debt as a share of GDP. Um, as you know, uh, debt has surged upward um, over the past uh, half dozen years because of the large deficits. Um, we project that uh, debt will be about flat as a share of GDP for the next several years, but then will can begin to rise again. Uh, and in our longer term projections, which we last updated last fall, that increase in debt as a share of the economy continues uh, beyond the decade uh, into future decades. So let me um, stop right there and see if you have any questions I can answer. Thanks a lot. Do you want to use your... Okay. Uh, I'm, not, I'm fine. Should I sit here? Whatever you're more comfortable with, yes. I think I can be seen. Okay, be great. Um, as you know, uh, we have cards in the audience, and they will uh, be talk some. I want to start um, with a question that this morning, um, uh, Larry Summers made a comment that the economy has not returned to potential, but it has cost, casted a long shadow on the future. I guess as you've been in your projections, it'd be interesting to hear what your assumptions about, about p potential and how it's uh, being uh, estimated in your, in your uh, forecasts. So uh, relative to the projections of output that we had made uh, in 2007, uh, so the royal we, I wasn't at CBO at the time, but relative to the projections that CBO had in 2007, we've now marked down our projection of potential output in 2017 by a little more than 7%. Uh, and this is a point that uh, Larry and others have, have noted. Of that reduction of more than 7%, we attribute a little less than 2% to directly to the uh, deep recession and slow recovery. So we think there's a one and three quarter percentage point reduction uh, in output coming from the persistent effects on the labor market, uh, particularly the effects of uh, elevated levels of long-term unemployment and pushing people out of work. Uh, and discouraging them from looking for work. But we think there's also been effects of the recession and weak recovery on capital accumulation and also on productivity. So that's a one and three quarter percentage points of this downward revision. The remainder, um, more than five percentage points of downward revision to potential output, comes in our uh, assessment from a re reconsideration of various trends that were underway up to 2007. So it is not directly related to the recession and weak recovery, but it is a reassessment uh, of, from our perspective in what the underlying uh, growth rates of key variables in the economy uh, are. And we actually have a report, which I hope will be out by next week, that, uh, that explains and documents these other sources of revision. So we do think that there is a long shadow from the recession and the weak uh, recovery uh, but we also, over this period, had made a set of other changes in how we view the economy that are not so directly related. They're still, of course, relevant to how much the economy will grow, uh, what incomes will be, uh, and what the revenue base uh, will be. So I don't want to minimize them, but I do want to distinguish them a little bit. Uh, we have a question. Uh, ratio of hires to vacancy is back down uh, compared to prior two cyclical peaks. Does this indicate we are back at full employment, and why not? So I, I do not think it indicates that we are back at full employment. Um, the number of people looking for jobs relative to the number of job openings is down from where it was a few years ago, but still elevated uh, to where it was uh, in 2007. Um, there are uh, a lot of people who are measured as being unemployed, s seeking work, uh, and uh, we think many others who have left the labor force uh, out of discouragement, uh, but who can and we project will be drawn back into the labor force uh, by an improvement in job prospects. And I think part of how one can, uh, as I mentioned before, one confirming piece of evidence for this view of the, of the labor market uh, is, the, is the behavior of uh, compensation, uh, which has increased very slowly over the past several years. Uh, adjusting for inflation, hourly compensation is barely up now uh, from what it was four years ago. And that is, in our judgment, uh, a strong sign of a labor market in which the weakness of demand uh, is an important factor. Um, we have a question on how much of the slowdown in health care costs growth is durable. Is that correct, durable? 
So the slowdown in, in health care costs uh, in the past several years has been very pervasive. It has been in Medicare and in Medicaid and in the private health insurance uh, arena. Uh, we wrote a long report last year documenting that within Medicare, it is very pervasive. You can see this in uh, payments for hospital services and payments for physician services and payments for prescription drugs. You can see it in regions of the country that tend to have high health care costs and regions that tend to have low health care costs. You can see it in the cost of patients who have high costs and patients who have low costs. So it's a very thoroughgoing phenomenon. Um, there's been some work um, outside of CBO on how much of the slowdown in national health care spending can be attributed to the weak economy and how much is left for other factors. And there's been a range of estimates. Uh, in our own analysis of Medicare, uh, we could not find a role for the weakness uh, in the economy or the loss of assets, uh, asset value by older Americans. Um, in our report, we quantify a number of factors that played some role um, but end up with a large amount of the slowdown uh, that is not traceable uh, in ways that we can do to either the weak economy or to other factors we can quantify. So we, th we think and we talk at some length in this report uh, in a qualitative sense about structural changes in, the, in health care in this country. And we think we have seen significant structural changes in the ways, uh, I think that is driven uh, partly by uh, realization on the part of health care providers uh, and to some extent patients that some health care uh, is not uh, necessarily uh, very helpful in improving people's health. I think it also comes from realization on the part of uh, providers and beneficiaries that um, the costs, uh, the amount of health care spending in the economy is really putting an incredible pressure on other goods and services that we would like to enjoy. And the realization on the part of people, as I said, in the system that um, with those pressures of high health care spending, they need to look for ways to provide care more efficiently. So what we've done in our projections uh, is to take them down uh, considerably. So relative to our projections four years ago, uh, spending from our projected spending for Medicare and Medicaid um, around 2020 uh, is down between 10 and 15 percent. So we've taken a substantial signal from the slow growth that we've seen, and we've actually lowered the rate of health care growth a little bit uh, beyond uh, this decade. However, we have not marked down the rate of growth indefinitely to match the slow rate of growth we've seen over the past several years. And if you look back at past experience uh, with health care cost slowdowns, um, they have in many cases been followed by pickups in health care cost growth. Um, so we think, uh, and moreover, I would say that um, for all the changes that are underway in the health uh, insurance system, both the federal system and private health insurance, uh, there's still an awful lot of parts of the system on which payments are significantly on a fee-for-service basis so that the incentive remains uh, in many cases to do more uh, services, to build more facilities. Um, in addition, there is a substantial amount of ongoing work in developing new drugs, uh, new medical procedures, new treatments. So we think some of the underlying drivers of uh, high health care spending will persist. So we've taken, as I said, a substantial signal and marked down our spending uh, with pretty low growth rates over the next several years and then some return to somewhat higher growth rates again, maintaining a lower level of projected health care spending. Um, but not uh, expecting that the very slow growth of the past several years will be continued in just that way going forward. And I think, in our view, that balances the risk. Uh, we look for our projections to be in the middle of a distribution of possible outcomes. Um, if the slowdown that we have seen the past several years really does last indefinitely, there has been a larger structural change than we realize, then our projections will turn out to have been too high. On the other hand, if there's a faster rebound, um, because of cyclical factors or because of a step up in the medical innovation and the dissemination of health, new health care treatments and procedures, then our forecast may look a little too low. And we think we've roughly balanced those risks. Uh, Doug, we have a couple of questions on unemployment. Uh, first question relates to your measurement. Uh, can you explain how you're measuring structural unemployment? It's a gray area among con economists. And then we also have a question, how do you think youth unemployment and underemployment will affect economic growth? So, um, so those, are, those are good and hard questions. 
Um, we, uh, we've estimated the roles for cyclical and structural unemployment looking at a variety of indicators and, as I mentioned earlier, applying our judgment to that. Um, if one looks, for example, at the beverage curve, the relationship between unemployed workers and job, and, uh, job vacancies, one can see a very pronounced shift. Uh, and uh, that says to us that there are important uh, structural factors. Um, at the same time, as I mentioned, we see uh, very weak growth of labor compensation. We see a lot of people looking for work who cannot find jobs. Uh, and that says to us that there are important cyclical factors as well. Uh, so by structural factors, what we mean is just the uh, people who are out of work for reasons that would not be directly uh, resolved by having stronger demand, uh, stronger aggregate demand uh, for goods and services. So if monetary policy and fiscal policy uh, were more expansionary in some way, um, that would, could in principle uh, take away the cyclical unemployment, it would not directly take away uh, the structural unemployment. That's how we think about the differences. And the natural rate of unemployment um, we, is a term we use to refer to unemployment for structural reasons. So um, at the end of last year, when the unemployment rate was about 7%, and it had been about 5%, our saying the natural rate is about 6 uh, is the same thing, essentially, as our saying that about half of that extra unemployment is structural and about half was cyclical. Uh, I think that the elevated rates of unemployment among young people are a, a very serious uh, concern. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we think that a number of people are, have been discouraged uh, from working um, enough that they will not come back to the labor force, uh, even as the labor market improves. Uh, some of those people are, are older people, people who've decided to retire earlier than they might have otherwise, uh, but some of those people are young people. And their loss from the labor force is obviously an economic loss for the country as a whole, uh, and also uh, potentially a very serious social loss. Uh, we have some other work underway um, about employment among young people, and it's not, not finished yet, and I don't want to get ahead of that work, but it's something that we're looking at more closely. Here's another one on unemployment, a uh, big topic, obviously. Uh, you elevate the unemployment rate based on historical observation that is exceeding uh, Nehru. But isn't that because uh, the historical emphasis is uh, the historical emphasis on on disinflation? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, if you uh, so the pattern that I showed the pattern of output tending to fall short of potential on average, um, and there's a similar sort of picture I could have shown uh, of the actual unemployment rate relative to the natural rate. Um, the actual unemployment rate has tended to be above the natural rate. You can see that pattern um, if you slice the data a number of different ways. You can see it um, over um, each of the past four or five business cycles, um, going back 40, 50 years. Um, but you also can see it, as I mentioned, on average over the entire post-war period. So the way we calibrated this gap in our projection was to look at the average gap between actual and potential output and between the actual and natural rates of unemployment uh, from the end of the Second World War uh, to today. And on average, over that period, um, the actual GDP uh, has been about half a percentage point below potential GDP on average. And the actual uh, unemployment rate has been about a quarter percentage point above the natural unemployment rate on average. i do not not sure that's the right way to calibrate that gap. Again, if one looks over just the past um, 40 or 50 years, um, you would actually find a larger gap. That's partly because of this last half dozen years, um, but it's also because in the last, in the few business cycles preceding that, output tended to fall a little more short of potential than it had actually in the first several post-World War II uh, business cycles. So the calibration um, is obviously uncertain, uh, but we think the pattern is, is clear enough that we need to take it on board. And we did this in our long-term budget outlook last fall, actually, and um, we've now done that in our 10-year projections. Uh, we have a question here on the probability that you use. Does uh, CBO attach a probability to a uh, U.S. recession in the next 10 years? And what might be the impact? So uh, we do not uh, have a, uh, estimate a probability of recession at any point in time. Um, the shortfall that we show of actual relative potential could be an economy that does not have a recession. It simply uh, never quite gets itself to full employment. Um, or it could be uh, 
the, um, an outcome that reflects a boom in the recession or various combinations. We're, we're not trying uh, beyond the next uh, few years to project the particular cyclical pattern of the economy. Uh, and we've never done that before. We're not trying to do that now. Uh, the change here is just meant to take on board average outcomes, um, but there are lots of combinations of booms and busts uh, or simply middling growth um, that could get us uh, there. So um, I think for the long term, as I mentioned, we took this on, on board, this phenomenon on board in our long-term budget outlook last fall. So over a longer period of time, we have output a little below our estimate of potential, uh, and that, has, uh, that reduces the tax base a little bit, reduces tax revenue a little bit. Uh, so it is a factor uh, making, the, making deficits and debt larger than they otherwise uh, would be. Well, Doug, thank you so much for your time today and your presentation. I'd like to have everybody uh, certainly give a great uh, round of applause for his efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to be here.